In Houston, on September the 21st, 1971, a baby boy is delivered by cesarean section under completely germ-free conditions. Born without a working immune system, he is immediately placed inside a protective plastic chamber. It will become his home for the next 12 years. In the mother's words, can you keep him safe and away from the germs? And we said, yes, we can. The story of David, the boy who lives in a bubble, has been told all over the world. His life would be portrayed in the media as a triumph of technology over a fatal genetic disease. But behind the scenes, it would be clouded by argument and controversy. When I first saw David, I was deeply disturbed by the fact that he was in this laboratory tube. I mean, I felt like I was visiting a rat in a cage. Almost certainly the first human guinea pig in history to live their entire lives in a laboratory capsule. For the first time, using rare intimate footage and contributions from his mother and medical team, we tell the real story of David Vetter, the boy in the bubble. The early 1970s were heady days for American doctors. Important advances in medical technology, from the iron lung to the artificial heart, had made it seem that anything was possible. At the forefront of medical innovation was the Texas Medical Center. Below me, a delicate operation is taking place, an operation on the human heart. The, surgeon is the center carried out the world's first successful heart transplant and was pioneering the separation of conjoined twins. Houston was starting to build a reputation for clinical excellence. Houston still had a bit of the flavor of the Old West. If you are a man enough to do it, you can do it in Houston. And that boiled over to the medical center that we had a can-do attitude, and we're going to do it. By 1971, we in the United States were well along in, in a remarkable period of medical progress. Medicine was on a roll, and in that climate, it was natural for physicians and researchers to want to take up any condition which was incurable and treat it as a challenge. They treated it as an enemy to be defeated and one particularly nasty childhood disease presented a unique medical challenge. Severe combined immune deficiency, or SCID, is a rare genetic disease. I'm an old athlete, and that was an opponent who had defeated me without giving me much of a chance to fight back. Jack Montgomery worked in St. Luke's Children's Hospital and was determined to cure this distressing disease. Skid affects only one in around 100,000 babies. It is linked to the X chromosome and attacks only boys, leaving them without an immune system and defenseless against even the most common germs. Back then, by the time Skid babies were diagnosed, they were so riddled with infection that death was inevitable. And there was just nothing that worked. And it was just so disheartening, one after another after another. In August 1970, Dr. Mary Ann South, along with Dr. Jack Montgomery, had just lost the battle to save the life of a boy called David Joseph Vetter. They were convinced that they could cure David with a transplant of his sister's bone marrow. She was a perfect match. But like so many skid children, infection took David Joseph before the transplant was possible. I felt that we had an excellent chance with David Joseph that was taken away from us by infection, and that if we were lucky enough to have this same match in an uninfected child in an environment 
that would not allow infection, uh, we were absolutely assured of success. As Catholics, David's parents, Carol Ann and David Sr., were anxious to assess the precise risks involved in having further children. Children were very essential to our hope and to our dream of the future. We wanted to have children right away. We wanted to have as many as God would send us. Montgomery and South advised the young couple on the risks they faced. The Vetters already had one daughter, Catherine. If they had another, she would be fine. But if they had a boy, there was a 50-50 chance of him having the disease. Carol Ann, the mother, asked me face to face, what would you do? And I remember that I had trouble because I knew they were devout Catholics. But I said, if my wife were pregnant with a boy, I would have an abortion. I just remember the look on her face and the dead silence. Then, in the autumn, an experimental biologist arrived at Texas Children's Hospital with a theory that would offer a lifeline to the doctors and the vetters. Dr. Raphael Wilson believed that he could delay the onset of infection long enough to organize treatment. He could do this by keeping the newborns isolated in a sterile plastic bubble. He was certain that if skid children could be isolated, keeping the child physically free of germs, given time, there would be a way to jumpstart their immune systems before they became damaged by infections. Wilson had developed his theory working with immune deficient mice. As long as the babies were kept germ-free from birth, a matched bone marrow transplant could repair the immune system. When we got to talking to him about this kind of project, well, he was very enthusiastic. He just swept us along with his enthusiasm. He had the confidence to say, we can do this, we can do this. Dr. Wilson's arrival transformed the prospects for the Vetters. Together, the three doctors made a pledge. If the Vetters were to have a baby with Skid, the doctors would keep him free of infection long enough to organize a transplant of his sister's bone marrow. They asked, if we have another child, could you deliver this child uh, germ-free? And if the child turns out to be uh, immune deficient, could you treat, treat the child? Yes, we said, yeah, we would. We promised them that we would keep him safe. In the mother's words, can you keep him safe and away from the germs? And we said, yes, we can. And we promised that we would do that. Within eight weeks of losing her first son, Carol Ann Vetter was pregnant again with a child who would make medical history. On the 21st of September, 1971, a young Texan woman was about to make medical history. I was wheeled into the delivery room. Everything was quiet. There was no conversation. All I could see were eyes, you know, just eyes peering. Carol Ann Vetter carried a baby that had a 50% chance of being infected with a deadly genetic disease. Severe Combined Immune Deficiency, or SCID. Without the benefit of an immune system, her son would almost certainly succumb to infection and die before his first birthday. The isolator was placed to my left, right within a few inches of where I was laying. I knew it was time. SCID babies grow normally in the womb, but once exposed to germs in the air, they are vulnerable. If this baby were carrying the defective skid genes, he would be safe inside the isolator long enough 
to receive a life-saving bone marrow transplant. Sure enough, he came out screaming. <laughs> he, was, he was the healthiest kid I've ever seen born. He was exposed to the air in the operating room for probably no more than 20 or 30 seconds at, at the very most. As well as being an experimental biologist, Dr. Raphael Wilson was also an ordained Catholic brother. He prepared to baptize the baby. I said, the baby's fine. Do you want me to baptize him now? And she said, yes. I said, well, what name do you want me to uh, give the child? And she said, David Philip. I said, I baptize you, David Philip, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The parents saw him as a, an authority figure. He, he inspired so much confidence, confidence in the Lord, you might say, and not in us, not in himself, but in God. I think that my association with the uh, betters uh, was based on trust, that they felt that uh, with my background,